think we're all superheroes just being here today. After this year we've been through, and I appreciate your attention and your presence today. Since we have some elderly people like myself in the audience, I'll tell you how this lesson came about. It seems as we get older that certain things from our past are more real to us than some of the things in our present. We tend to go back and remember things from the past, maybe a word or maybe something we see will bring it to mind, and we'll remember something from our past real vividly, just like it just happened. So that's how my lesson came about, because... I was born in a small town in Arkansas, and I was raised in a small town in Mississippi. And uh, I wouldn't say we were poor, but you'd have to look a long way to find somebody that had less than we had. And because of that, one of my favorite pastimes was reading comic books. And my favorite comic books were about superheroes. And I could lose myself for hours reading about Superman and Batman, Wonder Woman, and Aquaman. Those were my favorite heroes back then. And my friends and I would sometimes tie a towel around our necks and jump off of things pretending we were superheroes. Sometimes we jumped off of things too high and found out we weren't superheroes. But that's why the lesson came about, because... During this time I was reading about superheroes in, in the comic books, I was also attending Sunday school as a young, young lad, and that's been very, very many years ago. But I remembered my teachers in Sunday school were telling me about Bible superheroes. And I learned about David and Goliath. And I learned about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel. Samson and others in the Bible. But because uh, of my background and because I essentially wasn't reading the Bible, I was hearing stories and I was reading comic books, these Bible heroes, superheroes, took on the same meaning as my comic book heroes. Essentially, I didn't think of them as real characters. They were kind of like make-believe. So it wasn't until I reached the age of 12 and was baptized that I started reading the Bible for myself. And I wanted to read about these people that I'd heard about. So I started reading my Bible, and, and I went in the back of the Bible. Of course, back then we didn't have Internet, and we didn't have things that you could look at. And I didn't have Bible concordances. But in the back of your Bible, there was a little concordance. And so I would look back there, and I found out where these particular lessons were. So I read about David, and I found out that there really was a young man named David that killed a giant with just a sling and a stone. And I was fascinated by that because I read the story. And I read about Daniel in the lion's den, one of my favorite stories. And I read about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I don't know if I could pronounce the names back then, but I read about them. First Samuel, the 17th chapter, told me about David and Goliath. And about those three young Israelite men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in the third chapter of Daniel. And then there was the story of Daniel in the lion's den, and that was in the sixth chapter of Daniel. But in the process of, of reading just those stories, I thought, well, there must be more to the story. So I've read further. But before I get to that, I want to tell you about my favorite Bible character that I just happened to come across in my reading. It was the prophet Elijah. And I guess Elijah is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. Because when I read the stories about Elijah, I, I see a man who had humor. I also see a man of great faith. But I see a man who had weaknesses like all of us. So if you turn with me to 1 Kings, the 18th chapter, I'm going to read this, even though most of you know this story, because 
every time I read it, it just becomes vivid, and I can almost picture this scene, beginning in verse 20. So Ahab sent a messenger among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now let them give us two oxen, and let them choose one ox for themselves, and cut it up, and place it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other ox, and lay it on the wood, and I will not put a fire under it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people said, that is a good idea. This is the part I always, it really, really is, I can almost picture this, and it's actually humorous. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one ox for yourselves, and prepare it first, for you are many. And call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. Then they took the ox, which was given them, and they prepared it, and called on the name of Baal, from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they leaped about the altar which they made. It came about at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Call out with a loud voice, for he is a god. Either he is occupied or gone aside, or is on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep and needs to be awakened. So they cried with a loud voice and cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out on them. When midday was past, they were raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice. No one answered, and no one paid attention. Then Elijah to said, all, to said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two measures of seed. Then he arranged and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood, and he said, Fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, Do it a second time, and they did it a second time. And he said, Do it a third time, and they did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant, and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. It took a lot to convince those people that who God was. But I love that story. I just always read, love reading about Elijah. After reading about these superheroes, I learned more about these men. I continued to read about David, and I learned that he became king and won many battles. But I also learned something else about David. In 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter, I learned that my hero David committed a great sin. I was shocked and disappointed. Superheroes don't do things like that. But David was not a comic book figure. He was a real man, just like you and me. I, lay, I later read of David's sorrow and all the things that happened because of his sin. Even my hero Elijah had human weaknesses. If you could turn to 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, I'd like to read verses 1 through 10.
Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. This was shortly after he killed all the prophets. And how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And he was afraid. And he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. He lay down and slept under a juniper tree, and behold, there was an angel touching him, and he said, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and went on the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. Then he came there to a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. As strong as Elijah was, he was still a man. And of all the great things he did, he still had a weakness. Because superheroes in the Bible are like us. They do great things, but they have weaknesses. So Elijah at this time lost his faith. He didn't feel like he, he thought he was the only one left and that he was going to be killed just like everyone else. And then you read on further and you find out, of course, that he got it back. And all these superheroes had one thing in common. They had the same thing in common that the heroes in the comic books had. They all had a nemesis. Great Moses had the Pharaoh of Egypt as his villainous cohort. And you think about David, Goliath was his nemesis, and also King Saul later in his life. And of course, Elijah had King Ahab and his lovely wife Jezebel. So we all know about that. Superheroes of the Bible were great men and women, but they were still human. They suffered the same temptations and weaknesses as you and I, and they are not make-believe. Many people of all religions hear the stories. But they don't personally read the stories. They don't study the Bible. And so these people in the Bible, even though they say they believe in them, they don't really believe in them. And that brings me to the heroes of the New Testament, the Christian dispensation in which we now live. When I think of the apostles, I think of superheroes. All of the apostles were. I think of the apostle Paul and how he suffered more than any of the other apostles for the cause of Christ. And I think about the impetuous Peter. He denied our Savior, but later repented and then went on to preach that great gospel sermon on the day of Pentecost in A.D. 33. And John, the longest-lived apostle, supposedly according to tradition, died at the age of 93 or 94. And I think of all the Christian saints, the ones who were persecuted, tortured, and even killed for their faith. And I think of Hebrews, the 11th chapter. And this is sometimes called the faith chapter but I call it the hero chapter. And I like to read just starting in verse 32. Up to this point, it talks about a lot of the people like Moses and David. 32 says, And what more shall I say, for time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, 
of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourging, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised, because God had provided something better for us, so that apart from us they would not be made perfect. greatest superhero that ever lived was Jesus Christ. And the reason it's so important to understand about the superheroes of the Bible and to read the stories about them is because you have to know they're real. You have to read about these people. If you only know about David and Goliath, you might not really think David's a real person. But when you read about the story of David and his life and the trials he went through, you realize he is. And it's true with all the characters in the Bible. Elijah, Moses, you read what they went through, you get to know them as people, and you realize they weren't just men. They weren't just make-believe superheroes, but they were actually live men who lived and did great things. The reason that you have to know that is because otherwise when you come to the New Testament and you read about Christ, you might know about the birth of Christ and and you know there's a man-made holiday made around that birth. You might have heard something about him walking on the water. You may have even heard about the cross and his death. But those things are not real to you. It's something that's out there that you know about but you don't know Jesus. He's just a story. He's a thing that holidays are made around. Unless and until you read about Jesus' life for yourself, or unless someone who truly believes can convince you of the reality of Jesus Christ, then you'll never really believe. Turn John turn to John the nineteenth chapter. I'd like to read verses one through thirty seven. Pilate then took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put a purple robe on him, and they began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews, and to give him slaps in the face. Pilate came out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I had found no guilt in him. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Behold the man. So when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify, crucify. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by that law he ought to die, because he made himself out to be the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. And he entered into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You do not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. As a result of this, Pilate made efforts to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. Therefore, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out 
and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. So they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he then handed him over to be crucified. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him and with two other men, one on either side and Jesus in between. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier and also the tunic. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour the disciple took her into his own household. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus lived. He was not a made-up character. His birth was miraculous. His life was one of service to others and teaching them how to live godly lives. He died on a cross because of the sins of mankind having no sins of his own. If a person believes in him, accepts him as their Savior, and is willing to repent of their sins and be baptized, they can be saved. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. John 14, verses 2 and 3. If you're here today, and you've heard the stories of Jesus, or and if you've read the stories of Jesus, and if you believe that Jesus was a man who lived who died for your sins, and if you're willing to repent of those sins and be baptized, you have the hope of heaven. If you're here today and you are a Christian, but maybe you haven't believed like you should and maybe you haven't read the stories enough, you can make that right too by asking God for forgiveness. If there's anything we can do for anyone in the audience this morning, if you have any need, we ask that you come forward while we stand and sing the invitation song.